Hello and welcome to the Reinfused podcast. I don't know how long this is going to be or how often these are going to happen. This is kind of my first just test one just to see how the thing flies. It might end up being slightly unfocused. If you watch any of my videos, you know that I do tend to fly off on tangents quite often. But we do have a, one core topic which I want to cover, so hopefully that helps a little bit. In future, I'll probably try to get some smaller YouTubers to come on as well, or, or people in the community just to talk about things. But uh, yeah, this is just the first test one. If you do like it, then please let me know, just so I know that we should bother creating more. Anyway, <laughs> today's topic is the topic of why do we do retro? Um, it's something that's popping up a lot recently, I've noticed. A lot of articles about people, why they do retro stuff, and most of them tend to be, well, wrong. Or at least... Uh, too focused on the money aspect of things rather than the general nostalgia stuff. And yeah, even that it's, it's a, it's a huge topic and obviously different people do things for different reasons, but I can talk for myself about the reason why I do it. I started collecting what we'd call retro stuff a long time ago. I mean, um, what, I mean, I think I released my book on the subject about ooh, four years ago now. And I had already been collecting for about 15 years at that point. So yeah, so a, a long, a long time. Um, and I've always done it back then. I did it because I was discovering new things I hadn't discovered before. So I, I tend a lot of the collection I had were machines that I didn't necessarily have before. It didn't start like that. So the first machines I bought were uh, a Mega Drive and a Super Nintendo, which were machines I'd owned in the past. And then I discovered the PC Engine, well, the Turbo Graphics as it was uh, outside of Japan. I didn't know it existed at that point. It didn't really, I didn't buy the magazines that covered it. Um, it didn't show up in any of the shops in, in Bainstock where I lived. So I didn't know it existed. And then I kind of discovered that as by connecting to this uh, nascent retro community, which, yeah, it wasn't, there wasn't much of one back then, but uh, the, what did exist, uh, PC Engine was kind of up there as, as well. And by discovering the PC Engine and by going off and searching it out and finding one, I discovered this whole bunch of games machines that I never knew existed at all. Um, and then I found Japan, of course. <laughs> uh, back then, I, I don't think there were any proxy services to buy stuff. At least I, none that I knew of anyway. So the first few things I bought from Japan, I bought because of some J Japanese guy I met on Facebook. Uh, and he um, bid on auctions for me and uh, I paid him some money and he got things shipped over to me. So that's how I first got my collection started. Uh, the first few were PC Engines. Um, I had one Turbo Graphics, which was one of the rare European models, and it was uh, it was a real eye opener, especially when I started to actually be able to look at those auctions myself, the the and view them, and uh, all the translation services that were popping up around that time were a help for that. And I think Japanese language was relatively new for these online translations. I might be recording incorrectly, I, I admit, but um, it opened up like a whole new door for me. And at that point, I, I I had decided I'm not doing any computers at all. I'm not touching computers because computers were a whole other area of things. There were two machines that I would have bought just from the UK, machines in the UK that either I'd had, like a Spectrum obviously was the first one, um, but also machines I never had the opportunity to own, like the Amstrads and, and things like that. So I, I already said no computers. Uh, so I was mostly concentrating on game machines and I found a lot. I bought a lot of random auctions. The auctions back then were very cheap, especially in Japan, because this bubble hadn't grown that we're in at the moment. Uh, like I discovered the Super Cassette Vision solely because I bought just a box of random stuff, which I got for some ridiculously small amount. I don't really recall what the amount was now, but it was very small. Um, and that console was in there, and it was an interesting little console. And heard of it, didn't have any games for it. At least I thought I didn't have any games for it. Then going through a uh, a box, I discovered I, I had one cartridge as well, which came in a, another bundle auction. Um, I think I said before that I found the 
cartridge and then I had to go and find the console. In fact, it didn't quite work out that way. I found it randomly. I did buy a cassette vision that way though, because I had a cartridge for the cassette vision as I went out and sought out a cassette vision, the predecessor of the super cassette vision. So, um, and that was basically how my collection built. It was, it was just randomly going off and buying things. But this is for me, was the point of it. It was discovery. It was, um, I jokingly refer to myself as kind of a technology archaeologist, but it was sort of like that, right? I was digging around trying to find all these things that I'd never seen before. Um, obviously that changed. <laughs> Quite a lot of it changed. I, a friend of mine, uh, Ralph, who has been on the channel actually, he was the, he actually helped to found the channel back at the beginning, but he's not a, a camera person. So he's not, uh, there often. Although he did a sterling job on our Chernobyl, uh, documentary, which, you know, we did a long time before the TV series came out, just so everyone knows. <laughs> um, he kind of suggests, well, you know, you, you said no computers, but surely you've got to get a single spectrum because, you know, you had one even just to put on a shelf. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, maybe I will. Again, prices weren't that bad on eBay even uh, back then. So I, I did pick up a couple of spectrums just because it was, uh, you know, you don't know what's working and what isn't working. Um, uh, and then it was that, that kind of opened the floodgates. And, and then I did start getting things that I'd always wanted as a child. And... It's a dangerous. It's a dangerous way of buying stuff. It is when you're you're buying stuff that you kind of lusted for as a child. I came from a fairly poor family, so my computers were very limited for a long time in my life because it was all secondhand stuff and the cheapest things. The Spectrum, of course, being the cheapest thing in England, I that's, that was really all I had. I didn't have any opportunities to try. Um, the Amstrad. A friend of a friend had a Commodore, and a friend had a, an Acon Electron and a Plus Four at some point. So I did get to try those, but uh, there are a lot of machines I hadn't got to try, um, and some of them just stuck in my mind from the little adverts you used to get at the back of uh, the, the computer magazines. Like the Memotech was one machine which had always stuck with me. I'd never seen one properly, just in a grainy black and white picture in a small ad. But I'd never actually seen one personally, so uh, getting one of those was was a goal. Um, uh, it took a while because by this point the bubble had started to to come <laughs> come around, so uh, a lot of this stuff was getting a lot more expensive. Um, things in Japan were still cheaper cheaper though, and I found obviously I'd started buying computers, so I may as well continue that. And so I started to buy computers from Japan, and um, that's kind of when the collection got a bit insane because. Britain had this huge um, kind of revelatory uh, technology expansion in the 80s. And we had lots and lots of companies that started up, made one computer or maybe two, then disappeared. We had a lot of that. Japan had a very similar situation. But for them, it was mostly um, companies that joined this revolution, made a computer, and then kind of went on to be like technology giants instead so they hung around uh and a lot of that I, I i would guess is because of the msx standard the msx standard kind of making it so that all these manufacturers could almost safely produce machines because they knew uh if nobody else made like games specific, specifically for their machine it doesn't matter because there's a bunch of compatible games out there and applications and what have you so i think that's probably where the difference really was um in the two markets. But what that really meant was uh, there were just this huge trove of computers that I would never even have known existed before I was able to see them on Yahoo auctions. And at this point, the the third party uh, proxy services had picked up as well. So I wasn't able, I wasn't having to go through a person who um, at this point was getting a little bit uh, annoyed and also starting to pad his uh his side of things a little bit quite a bit so um it uh it was handy to just to be able to do this stuff on my own and just say well, i want to bid on this so i'm just going to bid on this it's fine um and i spent a lot of money i, I calculated at some point how much i'd spent over that period um and it's an interesting graph because at the beginning, before the bubble started to, to come about, I, the amount of items I had compared to the amount I spent was very, was really like the, the ratio was very low. Um, uh, in terms of the money, the money was low ratio, the amount of items was high. And that completely reversed 
uh, after the bubble kicked on. And then it was not quite so many items, but at a much higher cost. Um, and so the vast majority of the amount of money I spent on this hobby absolutely happened in the last half of that collection period. Um, yeah, so the, the amount was up in the uh, approaching the £15,000 mark, which is an insane amount of money. But at one point I did have um, so many machines that I was taking up two rooms in my house. And not small rooms either, to to one of the biggest rooms and and a, a slightly smaller room. So, yeah, it was an insane period of time. To be fair, because a lot of that stuff was I bought cheap comparatively. The when I sold it all off, and I sold a lot of my stuff off because I was made. I, I lost my job, so I had to. Um, it took a while for me to get another job because the market was in a bit of a downturn at that point. Um, so I had to sell a lot of my collection just to make sure we could make it through. And we ended up, before I lost my job, making a film and we couldn't get uh, backing for that. So we had to back it ourselves pretty much. Uh, we got some backing, but not enough to make the whole film. So I sold a huge amount of my collection for that. And when you work all that out, I definitely made a profit overall. Um, you know, which is great. <laughs> it's not why I, not what, obviously why I did this, but it's better than having to sell all this stuff off at a loss, which I think is something that's going to happen in the next five or six years. I think this is the, the, this bubble has got to the point now where you look on eBay and people are breaking machines up into parts, fully working machines to sell the little bits and pieces and then charging ridiculous amounts. Like I saw, I posted up an, an, a, an auction where a seller had taken a Commodore 128, the two, part unit the one with the separate keyboard they'd sold the unit for a relatively good price was it was going for, for bidding obviously uh, but the keyboard they put a starting price in the hundreds on its own auction so once you get those things happening then the bubble at some point has to burst and i think that's what's coming soon and there are a lot of things that i bought after that bubble grew which are probably not going to be worth nearly as much as what i paid for them and i imagine a lot of collectors are in the same situation as well but again I didn't buy this stuff to make a profit. I bought this stuff to to enjoy. And I have done. I have enjoyed all this stuff a lot. Um, it's always, I mean, seller's remorse is, is a huge thing. I think most collectors experience that as well. Uh, it's not nice having to give away myself, <laughs> but have someone take away something that you've you put a lot of work into well for me certainly because i mean i've never had the the huge bankroll that a lot of collectors have got so i tended to buy the machines that were in the worst state so the ones that looked like they were probably not working and collectors wouldn't touch them because they weren't in a box and they weren't in great condition they were broken obviously broken um and then i would repair those so i mean i had that it's handy to have that skill to be able to repair most stuff so uh, and we did, did a good job. So I've got a lot of machines here that just weren't working. I got a lot cheaper than I would have got because I just figured I'd fix them. Like mostly a lot of Amstrads, a lot of um, a couple of AES, Neo Geo AESs that I got a lot cheaper because they were broken. Only one I managed to fix immediately. The other one had much worse problems, but um, still got it cheaper. So, you know, that's the um, that's the key. Um and I think that's the the kind of the differentiator between a lot of this a lot of the way these things these things work if you um if you kind of you if you're going in at a certain level and you've got a certain amount of money then you probably don't really care if the market drops out um because you're probably not going to do anything with these machines you could probably afford to keep them for however long and they'll just sit in a cupboard somewhere or, or in a glass cabinet depending on the item uh, whereas at my level when you can't genuinely afford everything you want you're going to be selling stuff at some point so the bubble bursting is probably more of a danger for me than anyone else although i, I still do have things that i bought originally which are worth a lot more than i paid for them so honestly that probably evens things up a lot um but yeah <laughs> so <laughs> the rather rambly way for me to say this was my nostalgia is different. My nostalgia is uh, for things that I never had the opportunity to try. And I'm, I'm guessing that's more 
that I'm more focused around technology really than, than games. I think that's probably a big part of it. So I own relatively small number of software compared to the machines I own. I mean, the difference being the PC engine and the super cassette version and cassette version. I own like most of those the collections just because they are things that I particularly enjoy. So the PC engine is a machine. If you've seen any of my stuff that I, it's probably one of my favorite of that generation. Uh, by that generation, I'm including eight and 16 bit generations. Um, and it just has a fantastic library, which doesn't get nearly enough focus or attention compared to everything else. Uh, the super cassette version again was a wonderful machine that just was, um, was dead on arrival just because of Nintendo and the Famicom, but it still has uh, a, a, not a great library of games because there aren't many, but there are some solid games in that library. And the cassette version, well, the cassette version, is a special one because the cassette vision was the thing that set epoch as kind of being the the top dog in japan in terms of games machines uh the reason why nintendo assumed they were the ones they'd, they'd be fighting um as happened of course the super cassette vision got released far too late to um to trouble the famicom the famicom was way more popular than nintendo expected anyway um so I think in that sense, it's it deserves kind of to have that whole library. And there aren't that many games as well. I mean, I'm looking at them. And there's like is it eight online games. I don't know how many it is exactly, but um, not all of them were released. And it's uh, they're, hard to, they're hard to get because they, they just weren't many sold comparatively to compared to like mid and modern levels of console sales. But console sales, but it's... Um, I mean, it's, it's important to have because of just for historic reasons, really. Um, so, yeah, because of the, I don't go for machines that I have games that I want to play on, I do tend to try and find the weirdest hardware or hardware that just interests me. It's a problem in its own right because the, you end up with machines that you can almost do nothing with because there's no schematics online. So if they're broken, then fixing them is a nightmare. There's no software online. There's no... There's no articles on how to get things like Gotex working or any kind of ROM emulators or anything like that. Um, but, you know, the, the benefit is that I've managed to make quite a few YouTube videos of machines where I'm the first one to cover them, which is a thrill in its own right. It's I like bringing the, the attention to these machines to people uh, on the internet. I mean, it's it's nice. It's... Um, you're giving stuff away. I mean, this is um, leads into a conversation about why I do YouTube and why I was doing YouTube wrong for a long time. But um, that is definitely a podcast for a different day. Um, <laughs> but it's um, it's it's just it's interesting why different people do this retro thing. I mean, we've seen plenty of people again on you on eBay who definitely do this for one reason, which is they think they can make a lot of money out of it. Uh, I tend to sell stuff when I sell it uh, on social media rather than on eBay because um, I was kind of turned off of that because I sold a machine once and the very next day, because I already had a watch for this machine, just from historic reasons, I got a, a email from eBay saying one had turned up and it was, not just my machine, it was the same picture I'd used to sell it. Because, of course, the guy hadn't received it yet. It was still in my house. And he tried, basically immediately tried to flip it for almost twice as much. And that's fine. You know, you, you own something, you own something. But it just it feels uh, rude. And it just feels wrong that you're, you're buying these machines just for profit. There's just something inherently wrong with that. In my opinion, anyway, certainly. Uh, other people may not agree, but in my opinion, there's there's something inherently wrong with buying this stuff for just for naked profit. I mean, take it, play with it, get your kind of enjoyment out of it, and then sell it. That I understand that, but just buying stuff just to sell it, that's that doesn't feel right in many ways, but you know. <laughs> that's you know that's that's how capitalism works right so who am i to say um but then there's yeah the other people who who are in this because of nostalgia just naked nostalgia i use naked a lot <laughs> as a descriptor but just pure nostalgia um and 
I understand that. I do understand that. I understand this this going back in time appeal, the appeal of, of looking back uh, to when you know times were slightly simpler and things like that. But it's I understand that appeal. It's an interesting one actually on that topic because there's there's almost like um a sense of bullying that, that has started up again. There was a whole thing when you were at school and well, certainly around my area where if you were really into computers and stuff, you, you weren't obviously part of the cool crowd, but you were effectively uh, disliked by anyone that wasn't into computers. There was some weird idea that if you weren't solely interested in playing football or doing graffiti or taking hood ornaments from cars or eventually doing drugs and smoking behind the bike sheds with people you were just interested in in computers then there was something wrong with you um and that was almost understandable back then because computers obviously were uh kind of a, in a weird niche of their own um not that bullying is good, of course. Bullying is never good, but uh, it was at least there was you, you could kind of understand why people were distrustful of the whole thing. Let's say, but that sort of happens now as well, where there are a lot of you see a lot of articles, a lot of comments of people saying you know, why you oh, retro stuff. It's why you involved this ancient stuff. It's um, you know it's sad. You just have a and things like it's a hobby. <laughs> How is you know, hobbies aren't meant to achieve much. They're, they're a hobby. They're something you do when you're not achieving things. It's the weirdest thing. I had, um, do you remember the whole, the, the Vector bike, the, the weird computerized uh, bike that uh, they released? I coveted one of those when I was a child. They were in the, all the catalogs, like the Argos catalogs and stuff. And I absolutely coveted one. Was never going to own one because they were so expensive. But just yeah really coveted one and then they popped up on ebay and i just made a comment saying oh if i could still fit on this i'd definitely buy one which i think is a fairly innocuous <laughs> comment to say and just some edgelord decided to reply to me saying oh if you weren't going on about this kind of stuff then maybe you'd have sex and it's like mate i i'm a grandfather <laughs> i've got four grandchildren from my two children i've <laughs> i've had plenty thank you it's just this weird idea that you can't be interested in these things and it just makes you like less of a not even less of a man it's the, the weird um this weird kind of idea of an alpha male where they have to you have to be down the gym and stuff and it it's it's just a transposition of the old bullying where if you don't quite meet a set of arbitrary criteria that someone has set up then you're somehow less because you're you're not meeting their criteria as them but i mean the one thing that someone used to tell me was um uh, if somebody has to act that hard to be a man then there's a chance they're worried about something and um i think that's kind of the point right if you're so worried that somebody else isn't meeting these arbitrary ideals that you're setting I think the problem is that you're either worried that you're not meeting them or you're worried that those arbitrary criteria aren't right in some way. Because otherwise, why would you bother with other people not meeting them? It's not your business. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was a that was a big tangent there. But uh, cut, but in the same target. And it's weird that this, this whole thing has kind of sparked up again. Now, a lot of it, obviously, are just people that um, didn't get enough attention when they were a child. So they... They desperately want attention now and the internet gives them that attention. But some of it does appear to be people who genuinely, for some reason, believe there's um you can't do multiple things. You can't you can't be interested in stuff like this and just be a normal human being. Uh it's the weirdest thing. And these are probably the same people that go out clubbing all the time and just drink until they're unconscious. Um and they don't see a problem with that, of course, because um yeah, I mean that's what they're doing and it meets their criteria. Yeah. <laughs> that was a tiny rant there. A tiny rant in my in the podcast. There probably were a tiny rant in every podcast, to be honest. Um But yeah, that's my kind of spin on things anyway. The reason why I do it is uh to summarize, is uh that I just I like this technology. I like looking at old technology. I like seeing where we come from. It really is a kind of archaeology to me of being able to to follow how these things built up um and i've made you know i've made a, a video and a and a text log of all this stuff that i've i've covered and 
Um, I think that's, that's, I think for me, certainly it's worth doing and I enjoy it. Um, but yeah, I would be interested in like, your reasons for being interested in the retro community. Or if you're not interested in the retro community and you have an issue with it, maybe tell us why you've got an issue with it because uh, we're not in any way psychologists, but hey, we may be able to help. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, leave any comments in any part of the comment that's allowed to be a comment. And if you like this, then I'll know we should do more. And if you've got any suggestions of who we should talk to as well, that also will be welcome. See you next time.